Jim Brown is Doc Cotton, who may well be the single most famous person I have ever interviewed on Life Stories. I dread to think what I've signed up for. June Brown is an incredibly accomplished actress. She's very glamorous, she's very intelligent, had an amazing life. And I think they're in for a bit of a surprise tonight. Whatever he's dug up from the past, well, I have no idea. I'm going to chisel away and get to the real June Brown. Maybe it'll be quite interesting. Maybe I shall be horrified. I'm going to use every part of my interviewing armory to discover her. I'm gathering myself up to be able to spar with him, hopefully. So be careful. I don't think we've ever had a louder ovation for any guest in the history of life stories. You're like, it's like royalty. No, oh, it's very nice, and they all look very charming and very friendly, and I'm sure it's all going to be lovely. <laughs> <laughs> For 24 years, you've played this iconic character, Dot Cop. So how like Dot are you in real life? Well, I don't think I'm like her at all. She used to talk too much, and so do I. Uh, she has a faith, and so have I. Apart from that, I smoke, and she smokes, and she thinks that she's very well-dressed. <laughs> and so do I. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't mind me being so, so rude, how, how old are you? I was born in 1927. And that means, and it sounds nicer th like this, it means that I'm uh, three years and two months off 90. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. You do look amazing for, for 86. I mean, when... Well, you've got to hold yourself upright. That's the thing. It's all to do with the diaphragm. You see, as long as you hold this up, yep. this bit here, then, and you leave your shoulders loose, then you look good. Yeah. It's when you slump. Yeah. And if you want to look really old, you bend your legs and you stick your chin. <laughs> <laughs> Do, do you like Dot? Are you very fond of her? I wouldn't like uh, to live next door to her or anything, <laughs> not particularly. But if you play a character, you have to understand them. Otherwise, you can't do it properly. Do you find it slightly uncomfortable being as famous as you are? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, you said be honest. So I'm trying to be honest. I am being honest, I mean. I'm not We've trying. We've got your favourite photograph of you playing Dot. Yes, it is. Why do, you, why do you like that one? Well, she's full of everything. She's got her fat, she's got the kettle. And I think, when you consider I was 59, don't I look young? <laughs> and I thought I looked old. You see, never do that, because you're going to get older as you go along. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you do your own hair as Dot? No, 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 no. That was my own hair, incidentally. Mm. It was just known as a Dot. <laughs> <laughs> I once had a nice chap. And he wrote me a letter and said, uh, you know, that he really l liked me and he liked my hairstyle. And I thought he was joking, you see. So I wrote a letter back as Dot. I'm ever so glad you like my hairstyle. I was apprenticed once to hairdresser. <laughs> if it hadn't been for my Charlie, I'd have been washing people's dirty hair instead of their dirty laundry. <laughs> <laughs> he never wrote to me again. <laughs> A dot had this, or well, has this amazing catchphrase. You know the one I'm talking about. Oh, God, you see, you get so embarrassed. It's by... three words. I know. <laughs> oh, I say. <laughs> As June, your voice is actually 
quite a lot posher than, dot, than dots, isn't it? It is not frightfully posh, my voice. It's it quite posh. I mean, I'm quite surprised how posh you are. You see, I could say cross in that sort of way <laughs> that the gentry say it. I mean, you'll notice that some of the royal family, I think most likely the Duke of Windsor, mm. when he was young, used to say cross, and so did the Queen. Mm. They don't anymore because we have to be humble these days. Have you met the Queen? Yes, I have indeed. And was she as overall by meeting you as you were no, meeting she her? She didn't know who I was. <laughs> <laughs> I, I bet she did. I you? could do a wonderful impersonation of her, only I can't. When I went to this, uh, some birthday party in her Jubilee, people over 60, I think it was, and there was a rather nice uh, young man who was doing the gallery or something. He said, Look, she's going down there. If you go and stand there, she'll talk to you when she comes back. So I duly went down there. And she came back. I can't do it, can I? Not really. Yes, no. you can. Go on. Shall I try? Yes, you can. Yeah. <laughs> well, can I go here? Yes. Will you pick me up? You see, the Queen is. I mustn't do this, really. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and you are me. But you're standing about here, mm -hmm. you see. That's where you're standing. And I'm here. And this is the Queen. <laughs> I shall never get me knighthood now. <laughs> when you got the MBE, who, who gave you that? Well, that was the Queen. That was yeah. very nice. Did, yes. What did she say to you then? Well, you see, I was in this bright red suit, for the occasion, and this coal scuttle of a red hat, <laughs> and the carpet was red, <laughs> and I looked like a mushroom growing <laughs> I'm not supposed to be doing this. I'm not doing this stand-up comedy. <laughs> I'm doing a very serious interview about my life. You are Jim Brown. So let's get back to your very serious life. Jim, your career has seen you go from the old Vic to the Queen Vic. Do I have to be subjected to these sordid questions? Jim Brown, otherwise known as EastEnders' very own legend of the laundrette, Dot. Why are you persecuting my son? June joined the soap in 1985 at the age of 58, and since then she's appeared in almost 2,000 episodes. I've seen things going on in this community, and you're not exactly spotless in that direction yourself, Dennis Watts. June, as Dot Cotton, has been at the heart of some of the soap's most memorable storylines. Shut up, Ma! I'm no angel. From being tormented by her son. <laughs> having her eyes opened. Are you trying to tell me that you and Colin are... Homosexuals. To helping her best friend die. Ready now, Ethel. It's wrong. But with a career spanning 60 years, June Brown isn't just the chain smoking busybody from Albert Square. Well, that ain't what she feels. The remarkable thing um, that people, a lot of people don't know about June is that she has, has this whole career before television, which is on the stage. She began her acting career at the prestigious Old Vic Theatre. She went to the Old Vic School, and everyone was very lucky to get in, and you generally had to be very good, and that's obviously why she was in there. Where she was trained by Laurence Olivier. We knew that she was going to be one who would become a big star in some way or other. She always mentions these very posh actors, you know, like the Oliviers and all people like that she worked with. John Gielgud, Alec Guinness, I mean, she did all that Shakespeare and everything. She was a right posh actress, really. In the 60s, TV came calling. I'll tell you this and you can stuff it. I never cared too far for you. And in 1970, June made her soap debut, not in EastEnders, but on the cobbles of Coronation Street. I wasn't used to this kind of life before I married. But it was on the pavements of Albert Square that June really came into her own. Right, well, shall we give it a try, then? Get out of the way! When she wasn't playing Dot, June continued to show her versatility in other acting roles. I could smack him already. When they rang June up to pay Nanny Slag, she said, but I'm not small enough. Being an actor, you can't go pale, you can't go red, and normally you can't shrink. But probably June can do all those things at the same time. I am in charge, of course, as per usual. What are we waiting for? She's always returned to Albert Square. 
and in 2001, her character Dot found love with Jim Branning, played by actor John Barden. Dorothy, will you marry me? Yeah, I will. In 2007, John Barden suffered a severe stroke and had to leave the soap. Whilst John was being cared for at home, June continued to visit him. I've got to go now. We've got to be off. Oh. Yeah, we've got to be off. Oh. To explain his absence from EastEnders, his character suffered the same fate, leaving June with a challenge that would test her skills as an actress. Hello, Jim. It's me, Dorothy. The producers came up with this idea of, um, of Dot talking into a tape because Jim was in hospital. June performed a mesmerising single-handed episode. The doctors, they think it would help you, you see, to hear the sound of friendly voices, so everybody's done a bit and it's just me left. So here I am. When I watched her monologue, it was very, very moving um, because I just understood every word she was saying. Oh, it's so tired, Jim. Probably the most electrifying performance I've seen, certainly in a soap opera, but in, in any kind of drama. The incredible strength of that performance is still with me. All in all, it was a great piece of television. Extraordinary. It, it was the first time a British soap had ever built an entire episode around one character. Yes. In the, in the build-up to doing it, were you nervous about this piece of history you were about to take part in? I'll do my BAFTA speech for you, shall I? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get it. I nearly did. <laughs> the awful thing is that my opportunity came from John Barden's misfortune mm. because I thought, well, what are they going to do? How can you do it for one person, right or what? What are you going to say? And then with John having the stroke, mm. it was the peg that they hung it on. So that it was a sadness, really. What did it feel like for you as an actress to be able to do such an extraordinary piece of television? It was lovely. Yeah. <laughs> it was really lovely. I mean, you didn't have anybody there putting you off. Mm. You didn't have anybody there going, giving a great long pause before you could go on. You could go fast when you wanted to, and you could, you could, you know, you could do what you liked. And I, well, it, if anybody says they don't like it, it's rubbish. Did, did... To be the one in a, something and to be the star in something is lovely. Many people thought you should have won a BAFTA. Is there a stigma against being a I soap actress? I think we are kind of considered second-rate actors. I really do think that. Does it annoy you? Uh, well, yes, because you get a lot of very good performances in mm. soap. As what Gretchen said to me one day. She said, we're not stars. She played Ethel. She said, we're not stars. She said, we're household names. <laughs> <laughs> like Purcell, she said. <laughs> You were a young actress, and we got a photograph from the Emmanuel Street story, 1952. Yes, well... Absolutely beautiful. I know, the face hadn't fallen, and... <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have the baggage, and... Look what a smooth brow I had. I was so was serene. That, was it Botox even then? Or? No, you fool. <laughs> <laughs> when, you, when you look at yourself there, what do you feel? I don't really mind. I was glad that I looked like that once, but I think you'll have more of an advantage if you don't look like that, because you can't go off, can you? You see, <laughs> when you can't, you see what I mean? I don't mean go off, I mean your face doesn't go off. <laughs> <laughs> you, see, you see, if you are not quite so good looking when you're young, you suddenly, sometimes, grow into a sort of more of a beauty mm. when you're older. Mm. Have you noticed that? You're I, a... I... <laughs> I've had exactly that problem. <laughs> I didn't mean that. Yes, you did. No, I didn't, because I think you're a very attractive man. Thank you. And I do. I wouldn't say yeah. it if I didn't. Well, that's very nice of you, Jim. You're too young for me, but uh, nevertheless... Uh, <laughs> nice. Well, there's a will, there's a way. No. <laughs> I was also had been having an affair with someone else, and I was also attracted to another man in the company, so it's a bit... Whoa, 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 slow down. What?
You were born June Brown, Suffolk in 1927. Your father, Henry, was a businessman. Your mother, Louisa, was a milliner. We've got a photo, actually, of you, your father, your younger sister, Rosebud, uh, and your other sister, Misi. Um, this is on holiday in Great Yarmouth. Oh, it's my favourite one. I'm the one who looks as if she's wet her baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't. I was sitting in the water and a wave came up. <laughs> When, when you were 17, you volunteered for the Wrens, the Women's Royal Navy Service, and you had your first experience of acting, and that encouraged you to audition for the Old Vic Theatre School. When you were in the Old Vic Theatre Company, you met your first husband, Johnny Garley. Was it love at first sight? No, I just liked him. He had a, a big personality. He was very amusing, very funny, and he was very light-hearted in those days. And, uh, you know, he was, he was just fun to be with. But I was involved with Donald, who'd had schizophrenia, was up in a mental home, and I was also had been having an affair with someone else, and I was also attracted to another man in the company. <laughs> so it was a bit... Whoa, 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 slow down. What? Yeah, well, it, it was all... It wasn't all in one day. <laughs> You were quite a naughty girl then, weren't yeah, you? Yeah, but you never told anybody. You see, you, you didn't do all that business of saying about it. I am now, but it's a long time ago. Mm. Uh, you know, you didn't at the time. You, w nobody were you particularly, knew. particularly naughty, do you think? Yes, I think I was. <laughs> I think I was, yes, uh, than a lot of other young women, yes. But all these were before Johnny, right? Oh, yes. You don't want me to go through my sort of... No, I, you don't. Well, how many more were there? Do. I don't know. Well, I do know, but... I... <laughs> There's no one called Teddy as well? Yes. Didn't Teddy and you enjoy a, a, an experience <laughs> in the field? Yes, I dare say. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you remember what happened? Yes, I do. Anything you'd like to share with us? Well, no, it's just that a man walked past in the middle of it in the field. <laughs> I think it was like a... In the middle of what, exactly? Well, I don't know, really. <laughs> Do you think you were a little bit of a, a nymphomaniac, perhaps? No, I wasn't a nymphomaniac at all. I was looking for this, you know. I yeah. really was looking for... Uh, well, like everybody does, you know, their soulmate, Did you, feel, mate, did you feel Johnny was, was that person? Uh, yes, very much so. You yes, were really we, in love with him? Yeah. Well, well, we were great, great friends. You know, this is the point. I mean, you see, when we were first married, we, we'd be in digs and we'd stand by the bed and I'd put my arms under his jacket round him, we'd stand close and we'd talk for half an hour. Now, who does that? I used to say to my children, marry a friend. Mm. They didn't take any notice, but marry a friend. <laughs> <laughs> Never take any notice of you. And my mother used to say to us, marry money. Well, we didn't either, so, <laughs> so, so you married Johnny when you were 23. Yes. But the situation with Johnny took an unbelievably tragic turn. Hmm. He was a genius of an actor, quite honestly. He wasn't a leading man, looking man. So he always played the smaller parts when he should have played the big ones. And uh, I think it was the disappointment of that. And uh, suddenly he got lower and lower and... And then we were at Nottingham and he turned down a part. And I said, you mustn't, you must never turn anything down. You must never give up, never. And he did. And he said to me, oh, never let me give up again. But it was too late because uh, he killed himself about a month after that. When this happened, you, you'd gone to spend the night with your sister. Yes, I did, because I'd gone to Rosie and I was really hoping to stay the night because he hadn't, was not sleeping, wasn't eating, he was talking all the time, I was exhausted. And it was very nasty of me, I thought, I must have a night's sleep. We bought, I bought half a bottle of wine and I said, isn't it lovely not having our husbands about, just the two of us? And then suddenly I got worried. And I said, I've got to go back. I've got to go and see how Johnny is. And uh, I went back and... As soon as I drew up outside the house, I saw the curtains were drawn and I just knew something had happened and I ran up all the stairs to the top of the house and the room was full of gas. And Johnny was in bed, undressed, everything neatly folded on the chairs and his watch and his money. Because I'd left, left him a shilling and uh, eightpence so that he could put a shilling in the gas 
and he got the gas fire beside his face on the pillow. There was only a little one, and he'd left his will and his and note to me uh, written on the back of his script. What, what impact did, did his suicide have on you? I, I felt guilty, well, partly because of leaving him. I shouldn't have gone, but um, I didn't know it, but I was in a high state of tension, really. But I was tired. But, you see, this was the thing you did. I did always say to him, now you won't do anything foolish, will you? You won't be silly. And I didn't say it that time. Not for any reason. I just didn't say it. Oh. I never lived in that flat again, but I went back for the rest of my things. And the gas men were there checking the meter and the gas fire. And um, I said, how much was left in the meter? No, don't tell me, I said. So I didn't want to think that, you know, if I hadn't left him the one and eight pence, he wouldn't have been able to do it, would he? After the death of her first husband, June met and married actor Bob Arnold. They were great together, charming man, good-looking, great personality, and uh, he had his own career, of course, he was in Dixon and Doc Green. June became pregnant immediately with their first child, Louise. Trouble is, we're getting babysitters. As June settled into motherhood, she also made a foray into television. I'm sure she thinks we spend half the day watching her house. I wouldn't give her the satisfaction, Dorothy. Neither would I. She was a full-time mum. She was a full-time actress, too. You can keep your pill. It interferes with the whole of a woman's cycle. Within months, June was pregnant again, but the baby, Chloe, was born prematurely and died after just 16 days. Mum rarely cried about the, the baby that died, even when I would make her talk about it. She got a tough mo emotionally, I think, you know, based on the fact that her first husband committed suicide. So I think that's toughened her up. Six weeks later, June was pregnant again with daughter Sophie. The couple went on to have six children in seven years. Mum spent most of her 30s being pregnant, and I'm the youngest, and there's seven and a half years between me and the eldest. And throughout her pregnancy, June performed an extraordinary juggling act. It was hard work, feeding and whatever, and, um, but she still had to go to work. I don't know how she did it, being uh, pregnant and working. My sister was on stage with her before she was born when Mum played opposite Albert Finney in Lady Macbeth. And when there was no childcare available, June just took the children to work. She would take us along with her to whatever she was doing, you know, whether it was the theatre or TV. I think she was feeding me when um, she was doing The Provoked Wife, because when she did the curtain call, she realised she had some milk stains on her dress when she stood up. June and Bob were jobbing actors, so money was tight. They were very short of money, they must have been, because neither of them were getting much work. And everybody was expected to muck in. We were quite poverty-stricken. Mum was always going to second-hand shops to kind of, you know, clothe us. My first pair of jeans were my brother's jeans. Um, he grew out of them, so I had them. We had one family holiday uh, back in the 60s to Mallorca, uh, and that's after Mum had earned a bit of money. We kind of learnt to look after each other. We would end up sort of, you know, washing our clothes ourselves, and uh, my sisters changed my nappies. I remember having two babies on the sofa with a bottle in each mouth. Um, I don't think many six-year-olds would be allowed to do that now. I have heard June say that because of her acting career, she wasn't the greatest of mothers. But June has been a great mother to all her children, even though she may not have thought she has been. It's not easy in this business. I felt quite privileged, actually, because we had this amazing bohemian kind of lifestyle. Because we didn't know any different, we thought it was OK. But looking back, probably wished Mother Woods was at home more, was more of a mother than an actress. I mean, six children in seven years. I know, it was a lot, wasn't it? Was that the plan? Did you always want no, to have a... No, 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 no. I was quite surprised to, to have the third one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid it was Billy, wherever you are, Bill. I'm afraid I did call the doctor in, thinking I'd got something wrong with me, seriously <laughs> wrong with me. And he said, no, I hadn't, I was pregnant. Were you a, were you a good mother? 
Do you think no, the I energy? don't think I was. I think I could have been. Um, yeah, I think I could have been. Well, when you see your children, sort of hinting, I think, that you really have always put the work before everything else. Do you, do you feel what, slightly I, 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 guilty I, I about that? I wasn't a natural mother. I mean, I love babies and I love them. I think they're beautiful, the little curve of their neck and their little plump arms and they're so uh, enchanting, you know, and uh, they're lovely. Uh, until they start saying no. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I love my children. And, but, I mean, it was a lot of work. I mean, I'm a reader. But has the sacrifice of your work <laughs> been worth everything, the price you've had to pay, do you think? I don't think I could have done anything else, quite honestly. I can't think of that. Uh, no, I'd have been very depressed, very miserable. Oh, yes. Especially if I had to do, oh, no, I would have been awful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do love reading. You see, as soon as I got Lou to bed when she was the first and only child, and, you know, after lunch and down for an hour, did I do all the housework? No, I sat and read a book. And I would stay up after everybody had gone to bed reading till about 2 o'clock in the morning. So I'm, I'm pretty hopeless, because I'm a bit selfish, I suppose. I was going to ask you that. I mean, do you think, do you, think you have a selfish streak? I think I'd like to have. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm not a loner, and yet I like being alone, and I like sharing, and yet I want to read my book. And why have they turned up? Because I want to get on and... <laughs> <laughs> We've got a photo, actually, of you naked under a mountain of Bakewell tarts. It was big posters in London. I was really rather thrilled. <laughs> now, one of your claims to fame is that you were the first actress in Britain to ever appear topless on stage. Well, it was sort of topless, really. Mm. Well, it wasn't completely topless. It was just... Bosomless? No, I did have a bosom. <laughs> <laughs> but it was that bit. That bit. That and then bit. they put a little bit of coffee-coloured lace across it, you see, for modesty's sake. And I used coffee-coloured makeup. <laughs> so you couldn't see the lace. Uh, what, what was this for? Bousters. Mm. Oh, it was a classical play. Mm. Oh, you couldn't do it, you know. I wasn't a stripper or anything. <laughs> In 2009, you stripped off as Miss January in Calendar Girls. Yes, I did. Did you like doing that? Well, I didn't mind, because, you see, I was used to it, and if you do a lot of, well, tatty theatre as well as good stuff, you sometimes find yourself in a dressing room with the men as well. Mm. And I was in one where, uh, well, a poor girl, she had to be completely naked because she was a corpse and she was being embalmed. <laughs> You know, and so you get used to, you don't think anything of it. But you were, in fact, I think the only one who did the Calendar Girls who insisted on being naked. The rest yes, all I had flesh-coloured underwear. I didn't have any of that. No, you see, uh, I'd seen it before and the person was wrapped in a woolen blanket and I thought, that's awfully boring, I don't want that. So I said, I, I, I'm going to be a knitter in this. So I made my character, whenever we were in the WI meetings, into this person who knitted. And then, so then I had two squares, blanket squares, one on each needle, <laughs> and Sophie, one of my daughters, got me a lovely red velvet knitting bag, which was covering the crotch. <laughs> Well, the publicity picture for Candy Girls involved you naked under a mountain of Bakewell tarts. Oh, yes, that was rather glamorous. Here's, here's wasn't the picture. It? No, it, yes. There I you are. It is. Well, it's not all that long ago. I know it was all over. There it was big posters in London. I was really rather thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> you and your, your second husband, tell me about him. He was a very nice chap. He really was. We just weren't right for each other. It was, it was unfortunate that that was so. So that I did feel very unloved. That was the problem. Were you very much in love with him? I was at the beginning, yes. Once you got married, that, he never said he loved you again? Yes, I used to say, I love you, and he'd say, do you? That's nice. So I thought, well, that isn't very encouraging. <laughs> so I didn't say it again. 
But did, did that upset you? It must have done. Yes, that I wasn't very happy in that marriage for a lot of the time. Jim, mm. the road to Albert Square wasn't exactly smooth. By 1985, June was approaching retirement age. She'd been married to husband Bob for 27 years, but the couple now found themselves in dire financial straits. She was desperately worried. She was borrowing money from her sisters and not knowing how to pay the bills. Then, out of the blue, June landed a part in EastEnders on a three-month contract, playing Nasty Nick's long-suffering mum. What's all this then? Oh, oh, you nearly gave me a heart attack. She did breathe a sigh of relief, but she didn't know how long it would continue. June made an immediate impact in Alba Square. I don't want to be calm, I just want to suffer. Oh, the tittle-tattle, all oh, the gossip, all oh, the sniggering. She just fit the part of Doc Cotton like a hand to a glove. After only six weeks, the producers decided to keep June on. Make no mistake, it was nothing to do with any writer or any producer. June Brown created Doc Cotton. Dot's relationship with wayward son Nick, a drug addict, thief and murderer, had the nation enthralled. There's one scene where she's finally been driven into a corner with all the horrendous things that Nick has done. I'm your son. No, you're not my son. You're not the son I wanted. I wanted a son I could be proud of, and what did I get? Powerful stuff. June's character was at the heart of controversial storylines. She was incredibly racist, incredibly homophobic. I'll have to give you your keys back. I mean, I couldn't clean your flat because it'd be tantamount to condoning it, wouldn't it? Not to mention the fact that the pair of you might well have AIDS. When she finds out that Barry and I actually share the same bed, I then try and find her in the square and she brushes me off. That couldn't have been done without somebody like June. After nearly 20 years of turmoil in Albert Square, Dot found romance. When Jim found Dot, there was a kind of gasp and a sigh from the nation. I love you. I don't think you're half bad, neither. Finally, she found her pocket of happiness. You make it your ride. <laughs> While Dot enjoyed marital bliss, June was suffering trauma at home. Bob, her husband of more than 40 years, had been diagnosed with a rare form of dementia. Dad's illness was so gradual um, that actually I think it spans seven years. He became forgetful and he started hallucinating. He didn't want to be like the way he was and um, it broke her heart looking at him like that. June carried on working throughout his illness. Mum, for her own well-being needed to, to go out to work for her own sanity, I think. If she'd given up, she wouldn't have had the money to give him as good a care as she did. In 2003, Bob died at the age of 71. She was at work when he died, when she heard he died, and I think she carried on doing that day's work. She's able to switch into Dot and focus on Dot, a B Dot, and then afterwards um, go back to being June. That, that day that you heard that Bob had died and you were on the East Enders set, was it instinctive to you that the show must go on, you must finish your work and then go and deal with it, or how did you feel? Oh, there's nothing I could do. It actually died in Brighton. We'd put him there just for a fortnight in respite because Louise, my eldest daughter, uh, was looking after him. She was his carer, really, and uh, she needed a rest. It was just after Christmas, and he would say to me, I never thought I'd go this way, and I'd say, no, it's terrible. He said, and he'd say, I wish I were dead. And I'd say, yes, I quite understand. You know, it would say it like that, as boldly as that. So I knew that he didn't want to live in that way. So I didn't mourn him because of dying. You had been married to him for four decades. Did you not instinctively, when you knew he died, want to be at his side and just...? No, because there's no point. There's no point in being sentimental. I mean, there, I could do nothing. Uh, he was in Brighton, I was in Wood. There was one scene to go. So I either did the scene, or I went off 
and then it had to be done later on and everybody else had to be called in to do it and perhaps come in one day when they didn't have to and you you do rather think of other people when you're what well, I call that in the theatre but it is in the theatre in a sense you're brought up you are brought up to do it unless you can't anyway you know but I had him home and I had him in the drawing room you know, because I thought you're not going from a chapel of rest and you come and be in a drawing room and uh, we'll all leave the house with you as well. But if, if I could offer you a, a chance to go back to when you accepted the role of dot com and you could not accept it and say, actually, I'm going to have a completely different life now, would, would you still do it again? And it's very difficult to say because I really needed a job. You see, actually, I'd separated from Bob for that while, and he was all right. He was acting and directing down at Folkestone, and um, that year was terrible. You know, so you had year. big financial problems, so you uh, took yeah, the role so, mainly for that. Yes, yeah, so you can't say I wouldn't have done it. Are you are you wealthy now from all your success? No, and no, I'm not. I have to go on working because my pension wouldn't be good enough to just about good enough to heat my house. <laughs> Dot's had a, a very eventful life and obviously uh, had to deal with this son, Nick Cotton, one of the most ghastly characters to ever hit. So, brilliant TV, wasn't it? Oh, yes. I mean, he was lovely to act mm. with. And we actually knew our characters so well in the early days that we could ad-lib. And we did one day in the laundrette. We, they didn't say cut, so we went on. You see, my character, you see how different it was. She was very selfish and she was quite sharp. Mm. You know, and she was prejudiced, you know, is what Michael was saying. Well, those scenes when you had uh, Colin and Barry and they mm. did the first kiss and everything else, I suppose what was most powerful was that Dot's homophobia would have been exactly how many people oh, in yes. Britain would have been reacting themselves. Yes. They used Dot by the time she'd been friendly with them and then she'd learnt you couldn't catch AIDS off a cup. Then she was busy telling everybody else they couldn't. Right. In a funny way, EastEnders was a very... Uh, moral uh, series mm. because it, it had this morality about it and it was a teaching program in a funny way. Do you feel it's as real as it used to be? Uh, I mustn't answer questions about EastEnders. I'm going back to work on the 27th of January. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you don't bite the hand that feeds you, do you? <laughs> If I said to you, you're so lovely, would you be at all attracted if I were 20 years younger? <laughs> <laughs>Is it right you wrote it all in longhand capital yes. letters? Yes, well, I wrote it capital letters because they couldn't always read my handwriting <laughs> and, and I would get rather weird words come in and that weren't right, so I thought I'd better do it in capital letters. And I've lost weight because I didn't have time to eat. I heard you lost a stone and a half. I did, well, all but a pound. When you look at your whole life, and you've obviously had to do that, who is the great love of your life when you look I don't back? know. Do you know, I sometimes wonder if I loved anyone. I don't know if anybody else ever feels like that. <laughs> <laughs> do you think all that passion, all those tears, all that... make him come, make him come, you know, all that... <laughs> oh, you do. You think, what was it all about? Yeah. I don't know. Yes, I did love people at the if time. If I could take you to a desert island, mm. right, for the rest of your life, who would it be? Oh, well, I suppose it would be Johnny, because I'd have a lot of men, wouldn't I? Because he was a marvellous impersonator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd say, sing like George Guitari as I'm driving along, because he never drove. He just would say, isn't she wonderful? Isn't she marvellous? Isn't she beautiful? She's such a good driver. Oh, he's always praising me. Now, you see, that is the answer to all relationships. Mm. Mutual admiration. Mm. I swear to you. If I said to you, you're so lovely, would you be at all attracted if I were 20 years younger? <laughs> <laughs> June, even in your 80s, you're unstoppable. 
1993, June Brown made the difficult decision to leave EastEnders. At the age of 63, she made her directorial debut and also appeared in the critically acclaimed stage play Double D. If you don't like it, clear up. She was fantastic because it was really out of character. She was a blonde, tarty, um, tarty mother. I think we might be in with a chance there, Bren. But to the delight of viewers, EastEnders wooed her back after four years away. Tart? What's she see? What are you looking at? It really is me, Nigel. I ain't an apparition. She had the guts to return to the challenges of Dot because she knows that Dot will exhaust her and not the other way around. In 2003, June took another break to start an ITV drama alongside Penelope Keith. The M25. Marjorie and Gladys, a madcap road movie, was described as the Thelma and Louise for the Horlicks generation. I'm all right on my own, it's you. Always nagging and moaning. I need a ciggy. I think she enjoyed that because she could smoke all the way through. <laughs> I wish you wouldn't smoke in here. I need some air. June Brown is still causing a stir in her 80s. Strictly Come Dancing, she was dancing with Vincent Simone and he's... He's very much a flirt. Because she's a bit of a wily old son, so, you know, it's all that. In 2009, she stripped off on stage in Calendar Girls. When she told me she was going to do it, I went, what? She went, oh, Mike, if you've got it, flaunt it. All the others had, like, flesh-coloured pants, knickers and bras, and the only one who decided not to was our grandmother. I wasn't too comfortable about her um, taking her clothes off, but uh, I think she was well covered by her knitting. Recently, June discovered she had a new fan. You look so I'm amazing. Show sure my legs. Ah! Only June Brown could go on a chat show and end up by doing a double act with Lady Gaga. I actually am a very big fan of yours. Aww. I just don't watch a lot of television. No, I don't watch any. I think her dress wasn't fitting quite right. And Lady Gaga uh, got the safety pin out and, and tightened it all up for her, the strap, didn't she? What are you trying to do behind this? <laughs> She's making it form-fitting. Watch your hat, for God's sake. <laughs> you see Lady Gaga realising halfway through, oh, it's not my show tonight, it's June Brown's. I'm so sorry, I'm out of Leave her alone, she's a star! <laughs> the question on everybody's lips is what will 86-year-old June Brown do next? The great thing is you can't predict with June, and that's why I love her. I don't think June will ever retire. She'll just keep going, bless her, because that's the secret of her joie de vivre. There's nothing she can't do. There's nothing she can't do. She could direct episodes of EastEnders. I'd like to be directed by her. Yeah. Why do, do I? <laughs> do I? <laughs> We're such good friends, would we be at the end, you know? <laughs> Would you like to direct? I love directing and it would be all right, Barbara. I would be very kind and she knows I would. That moment when you stole the show on Graham Norton with Lady Gaga... I that... shall have to write apologise to him. I really shall. <laughs> <laughs> have you heard from your, your new friend, Gaga? Yes, actually, yes. I've been invited to a private, whatchamacallit, you know, showing in a nightclub. Really? I, I couldn't go because I had to get ready for this. <laughs> <laughs> so you stood up Lady Gaga for me, basically? I did. You haven't had a cigarette for about three hours now. Are you getting very itchy for one? I just... I would like one. Yes, I'd You like smoke one. just as much as Dot, right? I smoke more than Dot. Dude, how many a day do you smoke? I don't count. <laughs> a pack? Two packs? Three packs? Sure. Between... <laughs> probably 40. Be quite honest, probably 40. But, you see, it's like going to sleep. I never look at the clock. I'll be reading my book and I won't see, look at the clock and see what time it is because I'll know then how much sleep I've got left. So what you do is don't look, then you don't know, then it doesn't worry you. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to find love now in your life? No, no, I can't be bothered, darling, because I'm... <laughs> no, no, you see, I'm too selfish now and I couldn't be bothered to really look after and fuss about somebody else. Are you happy now in your life, would you say? I'm all right. I'm neither one thing nor the other, which isn't very interesting, is it? I think you're very interesting, June. No, but it isn't interesting. I think interesting you're a really me. fascinating, complex character. <laughs> I do. No, no, I'm not. You don't yes, think I so? Yes, I am. 
You are yes, right. I am. <laughs> If you were accentuating the positive about yourself, about June Brown, what's, what's the best thing about you in terms of a character trait, do you think? Well, I think I'm kind, and I'd like to be generous, but I, you can't be because of inheritance tax. <laughs> I'm, I'm very angry with the government, for any government, because of that. No, it is dreadful, because when you die, if it's seven, six, five, four years, they have the pleasure of giving the government another £400 for you giving away a thousand. Do you understand what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you know, June, well, how June, dare they? June. <laughs> Has it crossed your mind you're a lot more like Doc Cotton than you think? Who's going to walk with me? It's been fabulous. Tom Daly's faced with the task of turning a lineup of celebs into diving superstars in the brand new series of Splash tomorrow night at 7.20 and then from the high board to the ice rink when a collection of skating favourites return for the final series of Dancing on Ice Sunday night at 6.15. June Brown is Doc Cotton, who may well be the single most famous person I have ever interviewed on Life Stories. I dread to think what I've signed up for. June Brown is an incredibly accomplished actress. She's very glamorous, she's very intelligent, had an amazing life. And I think they're in for a bit of a surprise tonight. Whatever he's dug up from the past, well, I have no idea. I'm going to chisel away and get to the real June Brown. Maybe it'll be quite interesting. Maybe I shall be horrified. I'm going to use every part of my interviewing armory to discover her. I'm gathering myself up to be able to spar with him, hopefully. So be careful. had a louder ovation for any guest in the history of life stories. You're like, it's like royalty. No, oh, it's very nice and they all look very charming and very friendly and I'm sure it's all going to be lovely. <laughs> <laughs> for 24 years you've played this iconic character, Dot Cop. So how like Dot are you in real life? Well, I don't think I'm like her at all. She used to talk too much, and so do I. Uh, she has a faith, and so have I. Apart from that, I smoke, and she smokes, and she thinks that she's very well-dressed. <laughs> and so do I. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't mind me being so, so rude. How, how old are you? I was born in 1927, and that means, and it sounds nicer th like this, it means that I'm uh, three years and two months off 90. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. You do look amazing for, for 86. I mean, when... Well, you've got to hold yourself upright. That's the thing. It's all to do with the diaphragm. You see, as long as you hold this up, yep. this bit here, then, and you leave your shoulders loose, then you look good. But yep. it's when you slump. Yeah. And if you want to look really old, you bend your legs and you stick your chin. <laughs> Do you like Dot? Are you very fond of her? I wouldn't like uh, to live next door to her or anything, <laughs> not particularly. But if you play a character, you have to understand them. Otherwise, you can't do it properly. Do you find it slightly uncomfortable being as famous as you are? No. 
<laughs> well, you said be honest, so I'm trying to be honest. I am being honest, I mean, I'm not We've trying. We've got your favourite photograph of you playing Dot. Yes, it is. Why do, you, why do you like that one? Well, she's full of everything. She's got her fat, she's got the kettle. And I think, when you consider I was 59, don't I look young? <laughs> and I thought I looked old. You see, never do that, because you're going to get older as you go along. <laughs> Did you do your own hair as Dot? No, 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 no. That was my own hair, incidentally. Mm. It was just known as a Dot. <laughs> <laughs> I once had a nice chap, and he wrote me a letter and said, uh, you know, that he really l liked me and he liked my hairstyle, and I thought he was joking, you see. So I wrote a letter back as Dot. I'm ever so glad you like me hairstyle. I was apprenticed once to hairdresser. <laughs> if it hadn't been for my Charlie, I'd have been washing people's dirty hair instead of their dirty laundry. <laughs> <laughs> he never wrote to me again. <laughs> and Dot had this, well, has this amazing catchphrase. You know the one I'm talking about. Oh, God, you see, you get 